two nights before my husband actually passed away, I was so sick. I thought I was going to die as well. He was in a hospital bed and I was next to him. He needed help to get to the bathroom. and I had to call a friend to come and help him. And I literally thought I was having a stroke. My body was twitching. I was freezing. And I just thought, wow, they're going to find us both dead tomorrow morning. When I got those results, I was just like, somebody needs to know about this. It just was sickening to me. No nutrition discussion when it is the primary thing. My lumbar spine increased by 12% bone mineral density in two years on this diet. In fact, it's funny to me that at 70 years old, I have the shape that I've always wanted, but my skin's old and wrinkles, so I can't wear any of the clothes I thought I would wear when I got thin. <laughs> So good morning. How are you today? Good morning. I'm doing really well. Thank you. I was really hoping this would happen after two failed attempts. <laughs> We're here. So good for you. So tell us, let's just get started. Cause I, what, one of the reasons, you know, I kind of asked you to do this cause I thought you had such an interesting, we did a consult together and you told, you updated me and I was like, wow, that's really spectacular. So I wanted to share what was going on. And so maybe just give us a little background history on yourself. And I know you're, I think you're, Remind me, I think you're here in Washington, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember yes. exactly where you were. Yes, yeah. in Shelton by oh. Olympia. Okay. Okay. So tell us a little about your background. Who are you? I'm 70. I grew up on the East Coast in Pittsburgh. I think I grew up pretty meat deficient, protein deficient. I there was never enough, there was never enough meat. And I never thought about it until I was diagnosed with osteoporosis in my early 40s. And I'd always been about 20, 25 pounds overweight, but I was really physically active, very adventuresome, mountain climbing, rock climbing, bicycling, just I can't sit still. So I thought I was really healthy because I was strong and looked fit, but I suffered from constant, I was chasing tendonitis in my joints all the time. And I think that I had, I think autoimmune diseases come in packs. And I think that I had osteoarthritis and just a host of things, but I was so physically strong that I was able to feel like I was okay. And I didn't realize how sick I actually had been until I went carnivore and realized what it feels like to be healthy. <laughs> but then, and so anyway, active life, my husband was diagnosed with amyloidosis, which is a pretty much incurable blood cancer. And his health, just his journey was so challenging and so painful and so long and that I burn out and I ended up getting diagnosed with Graves disease, which makes total sense to me. I literally, I don't know where I got the energy to get through his illness. And it took him, it was, he was alive for about five or six years. And it was just being, having Graves myself and being solely responsible for him was really hard just, in and out of the hospital. Hey, Donna, just because a lot of people don't know what Graves disease is. Could you tell us in your words what Graves disease is? So Graves disease is an autoimmune disease. What's well, I hate the word disease. It's an autoimmune condition. And I believe that stress is, well, stress and food actually were stressing out my immune system. And so my body decided to produce antibodies that attack my thyroid. And it speeds up the thyroid and it speeds up metabolism. It speeds up the heart. And, and I had all of the, I had all of the symptoms. I had the eye disease. My eyes got really swollen. I had a goiter. I was irritable. I had insomnia. My heart, I was constant. I had to take heart medication. I was just, I was scared all the time. And then after my husband died, so I, from the time I went carnivore to now, I went carnivore because after he died, I was so sick that I just couldn't heal. I was exhausted. COVID hit. Fortunately, I was loving being at home by myself and 
grieving and dealing with graves at the same time. And then I got a horrible bowel. I don't know whether it was bacterial or viral, but it lasted a long time. I became very frail. I couldn't do yoga anymore. I couldn't get off the floor. I just had no strength. And so when I was diagnosed, I went on methimazole and it helped a lot. But the two nights before my husband actually passed away, I was so sick, I thought I was going to die as well. He was in a hospital bed and I was next to him and I he needed help to get to the bathroom and I couldn't get out of bed. I had lost so much strength. I was so exhausted that my legs wouldn't support me and I had to call a friend to come and help him. And I literally thought I was having a stroke. My body was twitching. I was freezing. And I just thought, wow, they're going to find us both dead tomorrow morning. I really, I just thought it was over for me. And the hospice nurse came the next morning and he said, I told him what had happened. And he said, you were exhausted. You were probably dehydrated. I hadn't eaten. I completely forgot to eat. There was so much activity going on here that I forgot to eat. And anyway, he died two days later and I went to bed. I just went to bed and slept. And then I developed this bowel thing that went on, caused me to lose a lot more weight. I became really thin. I lost all my muscle mass. And then I fractured my, I had multiple stress fractures in my spine. And I had been doing keto. It was hard to do keto because he was addicted to sugar. And so I was doing dirty keto. He, I was trying to keep him from eating sugar. And so I was making all the keto desserts and trying to give him something sweet that didn't, wasn't full of chemicals. And, and I, my refrigerator was full of food that he loved to eat. He loved cereal and bread. And it was just my kitchen was full of carbs. And after he passed, I just went through the kitchen and threw everything away. And I, when I fractured my back, I would remember laying one day on the couch, I couldn't move. And I was looking at YouTube and I came across your interview with Brett Scher. That was a couple of years ago. And it was a really good interview. And it totally convinced me to try carnivore. I just was so impressed with your knowledge about not just physiology and meat, and but the whole discussion about meat as food and what's happening in our food system. And so anyway, I became a committed carnivore immediately and immediately started to notice a change in my health. I was able to start doing yoga again, walking. Oh, and then, so anyway, I was diagnosed with osteoporosis, really extreme osteoporosis. And my endocrinologist really wanted me to take new own drugs. And when I looked at, when I researched it, it had a black box warning on it. And the this potential side effects were so extreme. And I kept thinking, I'm doing everything I know how to do. I'm exercising, I'm eating just meat. And I just believe that my body is going to heal. And I have to give myself at least a couple of years to see if I can turn around the osteoporosis because it's debilitating. It's terrifying. It's, I was afraid that I would spontaneously fracture reaching across a table or rolling over in my bed, terrified to trip and fall. And, and it hurt. It hurt. People think that osteoporosis doesn't hurt, but when it's that extreme, it hurts. I could not walk more than a mile or two. Everything would feel compressed. I would come back from a walk and I would just feel horrible. Anyway, over time, everything just started to heal slowly and my strength started to come back. And, and of course, the more, I, the better I felt, the more committed I became to carnivore. And it's just my lifestyle now. I can't even imagine going back. There isn't anything I want to go back to eat. 
There's, I don't want to start eating cauliflower and broccoli. They stink. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Hey, Donald, let me just pause you here for a second and just a few comments. Graves' disease, for people who don't know, probably the most famous person that most people would have heard of that, that suffered from Graves' disease was actually John F. Kennedy. So JFK had Graves' disease. And when you see this prophthalmos where the eyes push forward and you get the swollen eyes, which is one of the maybe pathognomonic features of Graves' disease. And then with regard to a lot of the drugs, particularly the class of drugs called bisphosphonates, which are often offered for osteoporosis, yeah, some of the side effects, jaw osteonecrosis, where your jaw just basically dissolves apart. You get these weird fractures in your femurs. I had to take care of some of those in patients that were doing that. And they are not without risk. And that's usually the answer is just do this. And so also, obviously, sorry for your loss. And it's obviously very trying when a loved one is very close to you, like a spouse is dying. And it's just got to be so... I hopefully don't have to experience that for a long time or maybe, but it, it, it's got to be tough on the body. And with the hyperthyroidism, the Graves' disease, like you said, you have all these cardiac issues and you know, it, it affects more than just what you'd think, the one, the isolated thyroid. The thyroid affects the whole body. Okay. You'd seen my sure, my, my interview with Dr. Brett Scher, who's he's a great cardi- cardiologist, by the way. He's a good discussion. I've interviewed Brett a couple of times. He's doing some great things. So... How did you start with carnivore? What was it? How did you just, how did you begin this? And tell us, tell me about the transition, if you don't mind. When my husband was, when I was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism, I had a naturopath who recommended paleo. And then her husband, a naturopath was treating cancer patients. And when Harold got diagnosed with cancer, he suggested the keto diet. So I decided to research it and see what it was and how it worked. And when I started to research it, I'm like, damn, I should be doing this for me. So that I went keto, but again, it was dirty keto because my husband was still alive. And the other thing is he loved to go out to dinner. His life had really changed. And one of the joys for him was to go out and have a nice dinner. So I didn't feel like I had a lot of control over my food while we were living together. And, but I liked it. I love meat. (laughs) I have always loved meat. And I just, I was so wedded to the idea that vegetables are like this apex health food. All of my nutrition learning had been plant-based. It was really hard for me to let go of that belief that plants were what was going to make me healthy. And it so anyway, I got to the point where as I let go of the plants, I realized that I didn't want them back, that I actually, it wasn't really the plant that I liked. It was the stuff that I put on the plant. I decided to take the stuff that I would put on a plant and put it on a steak. <laughs> there you go. Um, but the really cool part is I waited my two years. I really dug in with my endocrinologist and we went around and around. He was worried about my bones that I would break or slip on the ice or something. And and I just said, give me two years. Just let's see what happens in two years. And unfortunately, he retired before I got my next bone scan. But my 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 lumbar spine increased by 12% bone mineral density in two years on this diet. And when I got those results, I was just like, somebody needs to know about this. It just was sickening to me that there's no nutrition discussion in the healthcare field when it is like the primary thing. And so anyway, I never got to tell him that I increased my bone density and he would have been stunned. So anyway, I am at this point, I'm extremely happy. And my life is back to a new normal. I, the other thing is I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety, especially when my husband was sick and all of that is gone. I remember the steak and butter girl talking about when she first went just meat, that she had this sense of Zen calm. <laughs> And I get it. That's how I feel now in a way. I've never felt this calm in my entire life. So there just are so many benefits and the results are just, they speak for themselves. 
Yeah, the the osteoporosis, and you mentioned you have these osteoporotic compression fractures in your spine. Sometimes they'll do procedures. We'll do something called a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty, where they actually inject cement in there to puff up the vertebral bodies. And you mentioned it's very it, it, it's painful. And so, did that go away as well? Did the sense of this this bone pain that you were having did that resolve as well? Oh yes, absolutely. I'm now able to walk three to four miles. My legs feel strong. My I don't feel any of that compression anymore. I sleep comfortably. In fact, I have to really remember and stay conscious of not tripping or falling because I still have a long way to go. I'm still off the chart osteoporotic. But in two years, if I can do 12% in two years, in two more years or four more years, if I mean, it, I feel like I could actually get back to normal. That's what my hope is. Yeah, certainly your symptoms are better. You're feeling strong. You're, you are laying down bone mineral density. And I think the thing is, you'd mentioned you always focus on plants, more of a plant-based diet, maybe not completely vegetarian or vegan, but focusing on that. And we and there's clear evidence in the literature, study after study that shows people that are on plant-based diets are at much higher risk for bone mineral density problems. It's clear they have higher fracture rates, they have higher rates of osteopenia, osteoporosis. And a lot of people will, they don't understand the consequences of that until they're in their 70s or 60s or 80s or something like that. And then you realize how bad of a decision that might have been. And, you know, what, as physicians, when we think about bone mineral density, we often talk about up your calcium, maybe some vitamin D, but really it's a lot of that. We, the part of the, the equation we lay, we leave out often is protein. We have to remember that bone is something like 40% protein. That's what the, all the mineral is deposited on this collagen, type one collagen, very proteinaceous backbone for, to which the minerals are attached to. And if you don't have the backbone, if you don't have the protein correct, then you get these problems that you have. And so back to doing yoga, walking, obviously quality of life is improving, anxiety is getting better. Let me ask you about the Graves disease because that's another one that we just don't hear a lot about. Most people haven't heard much about Graves disease. We hear a lot about Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, but how did it impact your Graves disease? I am on a very low dose of methimazole right now and I have no symptoms. It's, it is the only drug that I take. I'm sleeping really well. I really feel healed. In fact, I tried to go off my methimazole in conjunction with, I have a functional medicine doctor that's been working with me around osteoporosis. And from that, what I now understand is that once the, my immune system started making thyroid antibodies, it becomes kind of part of its menu of antibodies that it makes. And so there's always going to be a, an amount, some amount of thyroid antibody in my system. And that's why Graves is considered irreversible. So it can go into remission. Like I feel like I'm in remission, but I don't feel like I don't have it anymore. Yeah. So uh, and, the, and the medication by itself didn't do that for you, right? It helped a lot. It helped a lot. At least it calmed my heart down. It helped my symptoms, but my thyroid antibodies stayed high for a really long time. So I was just managing symptoms and I knew that. But you can tell a difference now that you're on a diet compared to just a drug by itself, correct? If I go off the drug for very long, I start to experience high blood pressure. My heart starts to pound again. And my eyes get, my eyes are still swollen. I don't even know if that, that will ever go away. Sometimes it doesn't. So I, at this point, like I said, I'm, I feel like I'm still a work in progress. And I, if I, I have to keep taking them, I'm not willing to go off the methimazole if I'm going to get symptoms back. It's just, it, there's too much at risk. My eyes are at risk. My heart is at risk. So I just go in about every six months now and get my thyroid numbers checked to see where I'm at. And I have a new endocrinologist who is really disinterested in anything I'm doing. She orders my labs for me, but she doesn't, we don't really talk about it at all. She's completely, dis doesn't ask any questions. She ordered my 
bone scan and never followed up with me. She, I got a letter saying, I got your bone scan results. Let's schedule an appointment. And our, that her office would call me to schedule an appointment and it never happened. And I just thought, there's really nothing she's going to say to me that is going to help. I have this functional medicine doctor who is helping me, really helping me and, and is actually really interested in, is really supportive of the carnivore and ketogenic diets. I kind of stick where I'm at with her and try to just use my endocrinologist for labs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're kind of, they come on you here to prescribe the meds, run the labs, and I'll actually take care of the health work, healthcare somewhere else with myself and with right. somebody that actually takes the time right. to deal with all these other things that are important. So uh, go back to, like I said, when you first started carnivore, how did you start? What were you eating? How much were you eating? How did that feel to you not having all the vegetables that you were eating before? I went off of them. I started to go off of vegetables long before my husband passed away. So I didn't miss them. That was easy. I just had to believe that I was going to be healthy just eating meat. And it was really from keep from ketovore, dirty keto to carnivore was really easy for me. I, it just was easy. I meat. I like meat. It's satisfying. I have a big appetite. I've always had a big appetite and was always trying to control my portions because I always wanted to lose 20 or 25 pounds that never came off until Graves disease. And then I got frail, but I, it was easy. I, and I eat one or one meal a day, basically maybe a snack. Usually my snack is a hamburger patty or boiled egg or something, but I eat a lot. I can eat, I can down a couple of pounds of meat just by myself, but that lasts me. I can, if I eat a really big meat meal at midday, like noon, I'm good to go until noon the next day. I don't get hungry. And that's a miracle. <laughs> That feels like a miracle. Yeah. So it's, it was easy. Yeah. That's one part of this that a lot of people find very liberating is the fact that you can actually be satisfied for the first time and you're not dealing with that constant hunger. And how, um, as far as your weight now, you sound like you needed to put some weight on because you'd gotten so frail, but how do you, how hard is it for you to maintain a good weight these days? I... I weigh about I about 120. I quit weighing myself about three months ago. It wasn't real. My weight wasn't really changing. And I was pretty much eating the way I was eating plenty of food. Um, so I decided to break my habit of getting on the scale. And it was hard. I didn't realize how tied I was to that number on the scale, especially after having always felt like I was a little bit overweight. And getting on the scale was always disappointing. And then after I lost weight, it was like, Woo so I liked getting on the scale. And then I got addicted to getting on the scale. But I have decided that what's most important is how I feel and that I can tell overnight if I've eaten something that makes me feel inflamed or bloated or it's my system is so clean at this point that I just, I can tell what works for me and what doesn't. And my weight has stabilized. I'm right in the middle of the BMI and weight chart for my height. I'm happy. It's In fact, it's funny to me that at 70 years old, I have the shape that I've always wanted, but my skin's old and wrinkles, so I can't wear any of the clothes I thought I would wear when I got thin. <laughs> That's fun. Let me ask you, okay, so are you... Are you currently retired? Are you working as well? Are you? I am retired. My husband and I had a business that we ran together, very stressful, high anxiety business. And I retired first. I backed, I said, I've had enough when he got sick. He actually kept working in some capacity till literally the day he died. The night before he died, he had his laptop sitting on his stomach where he could always stay connected. And, and I just love being retired. I enjoy living by myself. I love my home. I've got good friends. I just, getting through the graves and the osteoporosis was a really big piece, but getting through learning to live in by myself was also just such a huge part of, it's hard to separate the two pieces. 
the grief and the trying to heal from that and trying to heal from graves and osteoporosis. It was a lot at one time. So four years, it's almost four years since he passed. And I finally feel like I finally feel whole and happy. And I, I love waking up in the morning and I love going to bed at night after a full day. And I love no, doing whatever I want to do. I don't have, there's no pressure on me. I can just live organically in the moment. So it's great. What, as someone who's retired, a lot of people would say a carnivore diet is just too expensive. How does this diet cost compared to, say, previous diets to you? Is it more expensive, less expensive, about the same? What are your thoughts? The cost? Did you say the cost? Yes. Okay. I would say it's getting more expensive because I really have a ribeye. And ribeye, as everybody knows, is getting really expensive. <clears throat> but it's my investment. I don't, and I don't spend money on anything. I, it's really interesting. It's not just the other foods that I don't buy. It's the allergy medicine and the sleep medicine and bowel medicine. And there's, there were so many, I had a drawer full of these over-the-counter medicines to manage symptoms that I don't buy anymore. <laughs> so I think overall, it's cheaper. I think it's cheaper. I'm willing to put my money into meat. <clears throat> yeah, good for you. You'd mentioned you have a lot of good friends, thankfully. So that's important, particularly as you've lost lost a spouse. How do they respond or do they know what you're doing nutrition wise? Or they do they say, Hey, what the heck? What's going on with Donna? What's going on with crazy Donna? She just eats beef all the time. Are you getting any of that? Uh, I would say that most of my friends were skeptical, but very supportive. They all trusted me that I was doing the research. I have studied nutrition for my own sake for many years, and I love brain candy. So when I discovered the ketogenic diet and started to study it, I just poured myself into it. And and I so people trusted that I, even if it wasn't something that they could conceive of doing, they trusted that I had enough information that I was safe. And it's really hard for people to understand. And the whole social piece, that's the other thing. My life was so, the social aspect of life involves so much food and wine. And now I look back and I think, it's like socializing is like this dopamine hit. <laughs> and I don't really do that anymore. So it really did change how I spend time with my friends. Like now, nowadays, I just take my steak and somebody throws it on a grill for me. And people know, obviously, I've, my body has changed so much and people see the difference. So it isn't something I think that in... Most of them are more conscious of eating fat and meat, but I don't know anybody that's actually decided to take it on. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, like I said, I don't know the ages of your friends, if they're similar age, you'll, most of us, as we see people, as they get older, they just, they have a lot of diseases that pop up. They've got their kidney, their blood pressure, their diabetes or whatever. And you see that and you're like, wow, if you just change your diet, you probably wouldn't need to do some of that stuff. Are you seeing, are, are many of your friends suffering with health issues? Everybody has health issues. I don't know anybody that doesn't. And even my people who eat a quote, healthy vegetarian, not vegetarian, but plant-based diet, who I have a 74 year old friend who just became a yoga instructor and she's mostly plant-based. She can't stand the sight of butter. She doesn't like meat. She eats a little bit of fish and some chicken, but her whole diet is plant-based and she's strong and healthy. So I really try not to judge. <laughs> there Evidently, there are just some people who can eat that way. But for the most part, everybody has some, whether it's digestive issues or immune issues. Everybody's got arthritis. It's, and I, that's what I think. I just look around and I think if only people would know, if only people realized how much better they would feel if they just cut out the carbs. <laughs> 
Yeah, there's, you'd mentioned this is something you were able to throw away all these over the counter symptom relief medications, allergy medicines, arthritis medications, digestive medication. Can you talk a little bit? You'd mentioned sleep was an issue for you at one point. How do those day to day quality of life things appear? Because, you know, you mentioned the Crohn's disease, the osteoporosis for which you were getting medical treatment for, but a lot of us are taking a lot of over-the-counter meds. There's a huge multi-billion dollar industry in that stuff too. And those things aren't really talked about as much, but talk about some of these kind of day-to-day things that maybe have improved for you. I would say for most of my adult life, I took to a leave every day for joint and tendon and connective tissue issues. And start realized, started to wean myself off of that quite a while ago, but I haven't taken a leave in years and sleep. I finally ended up with a prescription for trazodone when I was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism because I literally could not sleep and I had to sleep. So I took trazodone for a while. And then at some point about a year and a half ago, I decided that I was going to I know what it was. My my endocrinologist held me hostage over my trazodone. They wanted me to go through the whole Medicare wellness thing, and they decided not to renew my burden to pre- refill my trazodone until I came in and did their thing. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going off of this stuff. I don't care what it takes. I'm going. I'm not going to be held ho- hostage with night with sleep medication. So I, over time, I think it took about six months. And I, what I realized is that I'm sleeping really well. I sleep a good eight hours every night. I fall asleep easy. I wake up refreshed. I got lots of energy in the morning. So that's a huge thing. Allergies. I've suffered seasonal allergies, hay fever. Since I was a child, they had me on allergy shots when I was a little girl. And so I spent a lot of money on allergy medication. And even though right now the pollen's really high, my eyes get a little itchy, but for the most part, I haven't taken allergy medication for a very long time. So my bowels, I'm regular, I, which surprises me. That's never been true. My skin, there are so many things, Sean, that I don't even, the list is numerous of the things that my quality of life in my days. This past week, I went out and worked in my yard for the first time in about five years because it was too hard to get up and down off the ground. I couldn't even pull weeds. So there are so many activities that I'm doing now that I haven't been able to do for a long time. It just, the list is long. So it would be fair to say that your quality of life has dramatically improved. I think that's relaying that to me. The critics of this would say you're eating a lot of saturated fat and red meat, and you're going to potentially have heart disease. What, how does that impact you when you think about quality of life versus maybe I'll have heart disease? What are your thoughts on that? I don't believe I'm going to get heart disease. There's no indication I'm going to get heart disease. I don't believe the cholesterol thing is a myth. And And I've got a functional medicine doctor who keeps track of all of my numbers. And I'm really healthy at this point. I, my, I just feel that I just don't think my heart is, and I've had my heart checked and it somehow my heart got through all of that just fine. So yeah, I don't, I don't even think about it. When you said you had your heart checked, do you remember how they assessed it? What was it done? What kind of test was it? Oh, they just did an EKG. Okay. Okay. So no arrhythmias or anything like that. What? So you had a, at the two-year point, you had a repeat bone mineral density scan, significant improvement in your bone mineral density. What is the plan now? Do you repeat that another year or what's, what, do you know what's going to happen with that? I probably will give it another two years. So about another year and a half, I'll get my bones scanned again. I don't, I'm actually looking forward to it. I was dreading that bone density scan. After fighting so hard (laughs) with my doctor, I was just so afraid that there wouldn't be any improvement. And even my functional medicine doctor said, if you haven't lost any more bone density, that would be really, that would be a win. And so when I actually gained bone density, I was so excited. And so now I'm like, okay, bring it on. I can eat meat for the rest of my life. And I just believe that it's giving me everything I need to build bone. 
I don't take supplements. I eat cod liver every week. I eat sardines every week. I, I really try to get what I need, the minerals and the vitamins that I need from my food. Yeah, I think, and I so I focus on really high nutrient foods. Yeah, I think, and that's, and I think that's the right thing to do. Clearly, aside from eating meat, have you gotten stronger? Because as you probably know, bone density is dependent upon the muscles around it. Our muscles influence the bones. So are you actively getting stronger? Oh yes, and I also do resistance training. I don't use heavy weight, but I use lower weights often. And I actually have biceps again. <laughs> so I, when I look in the mirror, I have what do they call them? Mirror muscles. I can actually see the difference in the shape of my body and my legs. My legs are so strong. It feels so good to go out. And I live in a hilly neighborhood and you're either going uphill or downhill. So I, to be able to go out and walk my hills and come back feeling good rather than wasted is a miracle. <laughs> good for you. That's awesome. I, like I said, I would encourage anyone to, but females in particular, postmenopausal are huge risk for osteoporosis. So that's a, that's obviously a good time to do it. And then of course, getting the high quality nutrition, like we get on a carnivore diet is great. You don't have a pet, do you? You don't have a dog or anything like that. I have a little dog. I have a little dog who is old and was diagnosed with congestive heart failure about a little over a year ago. And she's, I fed her, she's been eating meat. She just eats my leftovers, but she walks with me every day and she has regained her vitality. <laughs> she's 15 and that dog loves to go for a walk. And uh, so I think eating carnivore is really good for her too. So she's new to she's new to carnivore like you were. So she was eating like kibble before and had congestive heart failure. Yes. And when I went keto, I started thinking, you know what? My dog needs more meat too. And now I just make enough for both of us and she eats my leftovers. Yeah, so. my, my my dogs are always hopeful that there's going to be leftovers with me, but they're never they're never are. So <laughs> pork, I feed them separately; they get their meat. But they always say every once in a great while, I'll have a piece of gristle that I can't eat, and I'll throw it down to the dog. But and they're willing to stand for hours for that one opportunity. For that's fun, I, and it's great to have a pet. But the one thing, the one caution I would say, particularly with little dogs, is I've seen a lot of folks trip over their dog. I used to take care of little old ladies that would trip over a dog and break their hip. And so that's the one problem. But if, if you're strong and you have strong muscles and you're getting stronger, then that becomes less of an issue for you for sure. But yeah, dogs are great companions. They're always happy to see. It's kind of like we left our dogs out on the porch last night and we didn't get home till 1130 last night. And I think it's the first time they'd been out at night by themselves and they were so incredibly happy to see us. Happy to see you. <laughs> they were very happy to see us for sure. And we were happy to see them, of course. They're, they're good. They're good animals. You said you, you can eat a couple pounds of meat, you get a good appetite. Did you ever have a poor appetite? Was there a time where you, or you've always had the good appetite? I have always had a really big appetite. I've, I just have always been hungry. I don't know how else to say it. I could eat as much as my six foot husband. I felt like I was never quite full. And it's the story is the same for all of us who have lived on a standard American diet. It's just those addictive. They're really, it's hard to give up those foods and what's interesting also is that I, even in spite of the fact that I don't eat carbs anymore, if I start to play around with recipes, like I got hooked on this new alchemy noodle that's gone viral. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but it's actually, you don't cook, they actually have the real texture of spaghetti noodles. It's a miracle. It is a miracle. Anyway, I got hooked on that. It's just egg and water with a gelling agent. And, but I, what I noticed is even though there's no carbs in it, it, the texture makes me want pasta. I really try to stay away from anything other than meat because those addictive, that addictive part of me if I get reminded, like I can be in the grocery store and see someone in front of me check out with Honey Nut Cheerios, which used to be one of my favorites. 
And I can remember the taste and the texture and the crunch and the cold milk. And then like for the whole day, I'm thinking, man, I really got triggered by that box of (laughs) somebody else's box of Cheerios. So I'm very cognizant that physiologically, that addiction is never really very far away. And going OMAD was a big change for me because I had always been so focused on food. A lot of my time was spent around cooking, and cleaning and shopping and planning. And of course, none of that's true anymore because it takes 10 minutes to eat. And so I had to really, Ken Berry made a comment about if you can't go a few hours without eating. It's not your diet you need to fix. It's your life you need to fix. And I really took that in. And I thought, I that's really true. I lived in this obsession with food and this all my life. And now to eat once a day, it's like this one, it's this one highlight experience. And then the rest of the day, I had to learn to really fill my life without food. It was big. Going OMAD was really big. It really caused me to really look at how food filled my life. Yeah, a lot of us use it as a source of entertainment. It's cheap entertainment. It's cheap and often unhealthy entertainment because we don't have a very fulfilling life. Whereas you could be out, I don't know, going for hikes and things like that. Instead, you're sitting in front of the TV eating the latest highly addictive garbage. You obviously you just gone through the loss of your spouse. I know how much of a supportive environment did you have? Because one of the fundamentals I think things that I see that is so important for not everybody, but for most people, is a sort of a support system around you when you're trying something like this. How much support did you have to do this diet? None. <laughs> <laughs> None. Because your doctor didn't care or wasn't supportive. You got no I guess support. my functional medicine doctor was the most supportive person. And your dog. Your dog, of course. And my dog, because he was very happy about the meat. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's one thing. If you have pets love it when you go on a carnivore diet because they're like, oh yeah. <laughs> I can imagine those poor pets trapped in vegan households. The cats are always looking outside. When am I gonna get outside to go escape? Like I mean, the, the vegan side. I can't figure out why my cat keeps wanting to escape. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So no yeah, so not I much support. Say, not a lot of support. People supported me in my experiment. But it wasn't anything that they were interested in doing themselves. And and frankly, the whole physiological discussion about being in ketosis is boring to people. They don't most people most of us have no idea how our bodies work and what happens to food when it goes into the stomach. It's just an unconscious habit. And so anyway, people were supportive of me doing my experiment. But I don't think anybody considered doing it themselves. Yeah, that's a great point that you make about, say, the difference between a, a ketogenic diet as it's classically practiced and just a carnivore diet is carnivore diet is so much easier to explain. You don't have to talk about fat metabolism and ketone bodies and beta hydroxybutyrate and checking your levels. And carnivore, you say, hey, just eat a bunch of meat to your full and you're done. And it's, and it's just easier to... I think even to explain to people for sure, it's certainly easier to execute for most people. It's just, just, hey, go to the store and get what looks good in the meat aisle and go home and eat. And I think that's what 99% of the people need to do with this. Now, there's there's some things that come up from time to time where you adjust a few things. But in general, that's a pretty good thing where you should compare it to a ketogenic diet where you're counting macros and measuring and net carbs or not net carbs. And it's just... And then, of course, you mentioned all the, as your husband had all these keto faux products, the fake cheesecakes and the fake cookies and the fake, all of them are fake anyway. But how much, how much less do you think about food now? Is it, is, what's your decision process make for our meal these days? So I eat when I'm hungry. And I, when I get up in the morning, I do drink coffee. Co- I love coffee. We'll never give up coffee. And I get hungry anywhere from, 10 o'clock to noon. And when I get distractedly hungry, like I can't focus on anything because I'm thinking about that steak in the refrigerator, that's when I eat. And I eat until I literally am like, I can't take another bite. And lots of butter. I use ubiquitous amounts of butter. And then after I eat, 
I don't think about food at all. I honestly, I, it never, it surprises me still to crawl into bed at night and think, holy cow, it's 9.30 or 10 o'clock and I haven't thought about food since this morning. And, and I can, if I start thinking about food before I go to bed, I'll start thinking about the steak that's in the refrigerator and I'll start thinking about, oh, that's going to be so good tomorrow. But for the most part, I, once I'm full. Yeah. And it, it's amazing. You eat when you're hungry. <laughs> Isn't it, that's just so simple and elegant, but some people can't, some people just don't get it. It's like, how many meals should I eat today? How much should I eat? I just, how does every other animal on the planet do it? Let me ask you as far as where do you see as far as going forward? Do you have any goals or thoughts you plan on doing? now that you know you're living by yourself, you got the doggo, you're getting your health back. Do you have any things you'd like to do with the next 20 years or whatever you have left? I would love to get back into the mountains. I would love to be able to feel comfortable hiking again. Part of the issue with my eyes is that my peripheral vision is blurry. And I have to be really careful because I I went hiking with a friend of mine this past summer and I had to scramble over rocks and I was really, I really did not have a lot of security that I just, because my eyes are swollen, I can't judge. So I'm hoping that my, my, and my eyes are better really slowly they're getting better, but I still have a sense of not being able to see off to the periphery. And until I can feel sure-footed, I'm not willing to go out and hike in the mountains again, but that would be my dream. And to do things like just to not be afraid. But overall, I really like my life the way it is. I, I could actually just do my yoga and Pilates and weights and walking and hanging out with my friends and eating meat. I can just, I'm really happy. I don't have any big goals. I'm not interested in traveling. And I just, I'm a, her. I tur- turns out I'm a hermit. I lived a really active, full, busy life with a man who was an extrovert. And, and now that he's gone, I'm like, whoa, I'm really quiet. <laughs> I really like my space. So I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully you get to accomplish all those things that you want to do. And like I said, as you maybe you convert a couple friends over so you guys can eat steaks together. And uh, cause you know, it'll, it'll be you know, one thing I think is going to be sad is watching the people around you that are somewhat close to you continue to get sicker and sicker and maybe not discover what you've discovered. So I suspect maybe some of them will. That's usually the case. If you just, if you just continue to, as they look around and said, Hey, look, Donna's staying healthy and strong. Why am I not? And they start to figure that out. So anyway, Donna, I've got to go. I've got a meeting I've got to go to. Thank you so much for doing this. I wish you the best of luck and thanks for sharing your story. It was wonderful. For the rest of the folks, we'll be back tomorrow. Anyway, have a great one, Donna. Good luck to you. Okay. Thank you for all you're doing, Dr. Baker. Okay. Appreciate it. Bye-bye guys. See you tomorrow, guys. Bye. Hey folks, it's Dr. Sean Baker here. If you guys are enjoying these success stories, you can become your own success story. You can do that by heading over to carnivore.diet. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and get started today. We're looking forward to supporting you. Our community is wonderful and we'd love to see your success.